I saw a commercial the other day. The camera begins on a couple talking about a social engagement that they have planned for later in the day. And then the camera flashes to their patio where you see the wife entertaining six or eight of their friends, sipping cocktails, sharing laughs. Let's just say it doesn't look like they're in a pandemic. The wife yells to her husband, honey, let's go. We're seeing friends. He comes outside wearing a button down shirt and underwear only to find his wife and all of his friends staring at him awkwardly. You didn't say we were meeting in person, he says. Feeling confused? Grab a Snickers and the commercial ends. I guess this is what it looks like the day after the pandemic. Having to put on real pants, not sure if your social life is on Zoom or in person. You have to laugh a little, right? About some of what we've adapted over these past few months. Target reported a surge in women's top sales. Most people haven't worn denim in months. And haircuts. People are sporting new do's, partners cutting each other's hair. Most people don't communicate without a link. Forget old fashioned phone calls. And our houses, living rooms, our classrooms, bedrooms, our offices, dining rooms, our playrooms, bathrooms are, well, bathrooms are quiet, but you know, whatever works. It's good to find a little bit of levity. But have you ever thought about what a world would be like where one day we are in it and the next day, we aren't. The day after the pandemic, how would you react? How quickly would we all adjust? And more existentially, the question that I've been sitting with is, how has this experience changed us? If tomorrow was the first day after the pandemic, if we return to what we imagine to be normal, how quickly would you rush back to what we had before? Yes, of course, seeing family and friends would be the highest priority and is probably what we're all longing for the most. And then sending children back to school and being in community. But what about the other things that we've gained from this new life? Working from home, family dinners, more frequent communication with loved ones who are far away, accessibility of teachers and classes all over the world, enjoying the outdoors more regularly when we can. It seems to me that there are parts that we would want to carry with us, and there are certainly parts that we will want to leave behind. This disaster that we have been living in is now a way of life. It's not a moment in time or something that will pass quickly, and because of that, we have to adapt and we will continue to do so. And it is important that we take stock because we have been changed. And what are we learning from that? Today, if we were together, we would be reading the second day Rosh Hashanah Torah reading, the Akedah, the Binding of Isaac. And I hope that you'll take an opportunity to listen to the audio recordings of some of our lay people reading Torah, Perhaps just open up the Moxor and read this Torah reading to yourself. It's a struggle. And yet every year we roll the Torah to this exact spot because that is what our tradition tells us to do. We are not just celebrating a new year. These are the days of awe and fear. The days where we and God ask tough questions and the review of the Akedah is just part of that process. In the opening verse of this section, we are told that God put Abraham to the test. And so before the trauma of the story even begins, we have a sense that perhaps Isaac will not actually die on this day and that this event is about something much larger, the relationship between God and Abraham or Abraham and his son. So Abraham obliges. He saddles up on his donkey and he and Isaac and the two servants ride towards Moriah to prepare for what God has asked. When they arrive, Abraham loads the wood up on Isaac and Abraham takes the knife. And he and Isaac walk together to the top of the mountain. 
Isaac shows signs that he might be nervous, but Abraham assures him that God has a plan. Next, Abraham lays out the wood and binds Isaac's hands and feet. Still, Isaac says nothing. As you can imagine, commentators have lots of questions about this. Some suggest that Isaac was a full-grown adult, 37 years old. So is it possible that he didn't try to fight back at all? Others say that he was fully aware of what was going to happen and that he too, like his father, had full faith in God and did not react. We rely on the Midrashim to help us, but the picture is not entirely clear. But as Abraham lifts the knife, God calls out for him to stop. Do not raise your hand against the boy or do anything to him, God says, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your favored one, from me. The ultimate test, and Abraham passes. Abraham, Isaac, and the two servants depart from that place, and that is it. But actually, this Rosh Hashanah reading continues. It doesn't end there. The very next sentence reads, Milka too has borne children to your brother Nahor, Uz the firstborn, Booz his brother, and on and on, naming the children who were born to Milka and to Nahor, Abraham's brother. What? This really caught me in my tracks this year. What is this doing here? Abraham just seconds ago almost slaughtered his son, his only son, his favored son, his most loved, and now we totally shift gears and get a full family history? Now, what we actually know about the Torah and that time is that it's complicated. One verse to the next can be hours or days or many years apart. And while commentators have indicated that these next verses are likely representative of years later, the shift in the verses themselves, the way that it reads, indicates some sort of normalcy, a sense of normalcy that seems so out of place after a traumatic event like the one that was just experienced. That even after what Isaac went through, the immediate tone of this text makes it seem as if we return to normal. Babies were born, generations lived on. The Torah gives us a sign of life. But what does not reveal itself immediately in this text is that life was far from normal. As we would have expected, his family suffered deeply from this event. Abraham, who had an intimate relationship with God, dies without ever speaking to God again, though the Torah does tell us that he was content and satisfied with the life that he had. And Sarah, she dies shortly after as well. Not only that, a Midrash tells us explicitly that Sarah died from heartbreak. The Midrash tells us that Isaac came to her in a dream and told her what had happened. Isaac had hardly completed relating what had transpired, it said, when she fainted and died. And during all of this, Isaac goes away and is really not mentioned until finding his wife, Rebecca. He isn't with his mother, Sarah, when she dies. He doesn't bury her or mourn for her. This family is essentially torn apart regardless of how the closing scene appears to be told. What feels challenging is that we know that the idea of the day after the pandemic is a dream. There will be no such day. It will be a process. And even more challenging is that on a day like today, on Rosh Hashanah, we are supposed to feel this sense of renewal we are supposed to feel a sense of being able to do self-reflection and tshuva with the hopes of living another year, a shana tova umetuka, a good and sweet year. And at the moment, that feels hard to dream about. With sickness and violence, the fires and natural disasters, orange hazy skies and days when we literally don't see the sun, it is hard to imagine that clean slate, a renewed sense of purpose and setting goals for the coming year. I fear 
that like the story of the Akedah, life on the outside could begin to look normal, but what will really exist will be a world torn apart, one that will take years to repair and will require much more than the tshuva that we are able to do over this Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And so, in looking for some inspiration this holiday season, I went to a book that I actually hadn't read in a few years, Lihitra Ot, which was the book that was compiled by many of you in the Beth Shalom community as a tribute to Rabbi Lou. The sermon that I was looking for is the sermon that Rabbi Lou gave on the Rosh Hashanah after September 11th. I was pretty young at that time. I had had my bat mitzvah, but I was not yet an adult. I remember comments like, the American people will never be the same. Our world is forever changed. I remember how our country was shaken and I remember the feelings of fear. And I went to this sermon because that is what I think a lot of us are feeling here today, right now. Communal tragedy and pain, fear of the unknown. And I knew that Rabbi Lou would have something inspirational to say, and he did. But more specifically were, was the Jewish text that he chose for that moment. It is a story of Rabbi Elazar a student of Rabbi Yochanan's who fell ill. Rabbi Yochanan entered to visit him and he saw that he was lying in a dark room. Rabbi Yochanan exposed his arm and light radiated from his flesh, filling the house. He saw that Rabbi Elazar was crying and he said to him, why are you crying? If you are crying because you did not study as much Torah as you would have liked, don't worry. It's not about how much you've studied, but what you learned and how sincere you were in those studies. No, that is not why I'm crying, says Rabbi Elazar. If you are weakened because you lack sustenance and you are unable to earn a livelihood, well, don't worry about that either. You can't have everything, so you shouldn't be upset that you're not wealthy. No, that is not why I'm crying, says Rabbi Elazar. Well then, you must have lost a child. And if you are crying over children who have died, this is the bone that I wear around my neck. It is the bone of my 10th son. So don't worry, everyone is suffering, not only you. No, not that either. I am crying because of Shufra de Vale be Afraka Bechena. I'm crying because all of this beauty that will decompose into the earth. Rabbi Yochanan said to him, over this, it is certainly appropriate to weep. And both cried over the fleeting nature of beauty in the world and death that will eventually overcome us all. We learn from this that it is not only okay to cry, it is encouraged, it is valid, it is welcomed. You may have good health, and a roof over your head, and yet, we are all grieving. Like the two rabbis in the story, we cry for the beauty we have lost and the collective grief we have all experienced over these past few months. And as we remember, Isaac's family experienced deep loss as well. And still, Isaac found love, his wife, Rebecca, who he went on to start a family with. Think about a blessing, just one, that you have been granted over these past seven months. And now, think about one dream that you have for the coming year. I dream of the day after the pandemic. I dream of the moment when we can walk down the streets without having to move away from one another. I dream of Shabbat dinners, singing together at Kabbalat Shabbat, kids running in the sanctuaries, and simchas, many, many simchas. And I know that we have a long road ahead of us, a long, 
bumpy and uncertain road. And for that, I want to remind you that I'm still here. Congregation Beth Shalom is here and we are strong and we will get through this. We are getting through this. Remember your blessings. Remember your dreams. It is those which we need to carry with us into this coming year. Shana Tova Umetuka, a wonderful and sweet year to all of you. <laughs>